Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the final segment of Youth Matters where we are discussing the recent rise in hate crimes. Now, uh, joining us uh, again is Pachita Begum, so thank you for coming back. And we also have Elaine uh, Bagshaw, who's the spokesperson for Liberal Democrat in Limehouse. And we also have Sonia, who's a psychologist uh, uh, on the show. Um, so thank you for coming on the show. As always, you know, we want to listen to you. You know, if you know someone who's been affected by this or, you know, you've got a view on this, then please get in touch. You've got the number on the screen and also the email address. You know, please contact us and tell us what you think. Uh, Coming back to you, uh, Elaine, um, do you, you know, some might argue that, you know, the media exaggerating what's happened and, you know, uh, what's, what's your view on that? I, I don't think it's exaggerating it in terms of numbers of attacks or anything like that. Um, if anything, it's been a far more subdued response than, say, if um, the attacks had been against uh, a different community. So if, for example, young white women um, had been targeted, I think there'd have been a very different reaction in the media. Um, and if, it had, if the perpetrator had been from a different ethnic community, then that, the way that would have played out in the media would be very different from what you're getting now, which actually feels like a relatively subdued response to what's happened. Um, I guess in some ways that's good because it's calmer than it might normally be, um, which can be helpful in terms of it's not whipping up a lot of fear mongering. But then at the same time, it does feed this idea that for um, the Muslim community in the UK, whatever happens to you or in the community, you will always be talked about in a different way sure. um, and feeds that perception that if it happens to you in some ways, it's not as bad as if it happened to say someone like me, which um, is not is, is not a helpful way of, uh, of portraying it, I don't sure. think. Sure, and Majida, you know, uh, following on from what Elaine has said, you know, do you feel that, you know, the media has kind of, uh, it's created more kind of anxiety within the Muslim community living in Britain? Do you feel that, you know, that scaremongering, it, it has created that sense of kind of fear uh, within, within communities uh, here? I think to an extent it has, and there is some anxiety. For example, like our parents from reading the newspaper, sharing things on Facebook, we'll feel more on edge. But at the same time, it's a good thing because it's created so much more awareness. And if you compare, if you think about just last year, similar things were happening. But at the moment, there's so much more awareness because so many more news outlets have chosen to share these things and social media and shows just like this. Mm. So I think it's good and bad in that sense. Sure. And Sonia, you know, we've, we've, we've touched upon it, but do you feel women are more vulnerable to hate crimes and why? Yes, women are more vulnerable. Muslim women are more vulnerable to hate crimes. Again, like we had said in the second segment, because of the influx in what's happening um, and kind of empowering, you know, I guess, people to go out and commit these heinous crimes. Um, but is I it, can give you do, they, do they feel that women are easy targets? Yeah, of course they feel women are easy targets. Women are vulnerable, I guess, to them. Mm. Um, is that because women won't fight back, say, compared to, to a man who might? Is, perhaps, is that the reason? Perhaps. Perhaps, yes, so. Um, if I can give you an experience um, with Majida and I, in fact, and it was Majida's mother, um, she's also my neighbour, um, we had a case where her and her mother, um, her, sorry, no, Majida's mum and her um, friend were doing a school run in the morning, and on the way back home, um, there was four gentlemen in a car um, who called them for help. So they assumed, okay, they probably lost, need some direction. So both the women who wear face veils, niqab, uh, went forward and asked, you know, how can we help? And the guy just looked at him. It was a white, white gentleman. Um, he looked at her and said, why do you wear that? Referring to the face veil. And um, she said, because A, it's, I have a freedom of speech, freedom of right, and B, because um, it's my faith, it's part of my faith. Without saying a word, he got out of the car and he started violently beating her up. Um, and that's when my neighbour was calling local people for help. And the second gentleman got out of the car and started violently beating her up as well and he ripped off the face veil. What do these things say? You know, these people are ignorant, you know. They're not willing to, you know, come together in a community and support each other and live by, live by each other. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, 
as a result of, of, of these two attacks, these women, for example, um, my neighbor, she didn't want to report it. Mm. She didn't want to report sure. it because she was scared, she, she, fear, and also shame. Right. So we need to eliminate these things. Mm. You know, we need to work together to mm. s you know, reduce selective reporting. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, I believe we have a caller on the line who was a victim of a hate crime herself. And uh, do we have uh, Mina on the line? Salaam alaikum, Mina. Uh, alaikum salam. Thank you, sister, for calling in. And, uh, you know, please please share with us and the audience watching, you know, what happened to you? Yeah, um, inshallah. Um, okay, so um, about two weeks ago, well, two weeks ago today, actually, um, my I had my eight-year-old son with me, and we were a victim of an attack. In, we were killed in Bethnal Green. Um, so we were on our way to football club. It was two o'clock in the afternoon in a very public open place you know it's my local park uh just on the doorstep and it's something that you know nobody well, I, I didn't think would ever happen to me um mm. i think it was a hate crime this guy who assaulted me obviously saw you know uh, 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 well obviously i wear my hijab and it's a vulnerable woman with a child um he assaulted me and I believe if it was just a robbery, then he wouldn't have continued to punch me, kick me, stamp on me, even after he'd gotten my bag. Um, this guy, there was two of them. Uh, one ran off when the first one attacked me. Uh, he came back and further assaulted me a second time. Um, and then uh, the attacker did have an, uh, he had a substance on him. Uh, which was either a pepper spray or an acid. Um, it hasn't been confirmed yet. Uh, but alhamdulillah, he didn't get a chance to use it. Uh, thankfully, a, stand, a bystander saw it and it, they put it aside for the police, so the police do have that. Um, I think I did catch the guy off guard. They didn't expect like a vulnerable woman with a child to resist or fight back. Uh, alhamdulillah, a lot of people helped in sort of making sure he didn't get away. Um, especially brothers from the, the Valence Football Club who are based, uh, who have their sort of sessions on Saturdays, um, help uh, catch this guy. Um, so yeah, no, it's just been a very uh, trauma traumatic uh, experience. It's something I didn't think I would ever experience, um, and it's just something I wouldn't wish on, you know, to happen to anybody. And it's something that needs to be done, uh, to, you know, as a community, um, but especially individuals, to sort of be vigilant and to be aware. And we need to make people aware um, that it's happening so Mina, often in now, terms and of, it's very scary, to be honest. Mina, in terms of uh, psychological, how has it affected you psychologically? Say, for example, well, when, mean, you, when you go out yeah, the house now. How are you different to say before the incident? Oh, um, I can't even begin to explain. You know, I'm, I, I'm quite. I believe I'm quite a strong person. Um, before this happened, you know, I didn't. Uh, you know, I, I didn't give it a second thought. I never thought it happened to me. But even two weeks down the line now, I am. I'm afraid when I do go out, everybody looks like a potential attacker. I've, I'm. I'm. You know, I'm. I'm thinking of. Um, things I can take with me to protect myself or my son. Um, you know, I'm looking into taking self-defense classes. Uh, I mean, even if I did have something the way it happened, I doubt I would have had a chance to, because the initial shock that takes over, even now I'm still in shock that this has happened. Sure. And, you know, uh, all my friends and family, everybody's just scared. Uh, you, you know, you see someone go past on a moped or look at you, and it just looks like anybody could attack at any time. But my worry, especially for my son, um, who's, you know, to this day, every day, he's physically being sick, he's vomiting from the anxiety, uh, from this, um, that he's suffering now because of this, uh, you know, attack. Of course. And how do you think enough is being done uh, to tackle this issue? I don't think there is. I mean, I I did um, just after this incident happened. There was a meeting held at the Mariam Centre where the Borough Commander Sue Williams um, held for uh, sisters to go along to to try and um, sort of help um, discuss or for people to go and 
talk about their issues. Um, and it was helpful to go along to, but just like just for every day, you know, I, I just among the community within my family and circle of friends, we're all just really scared. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to expect. And it's become so common and it's just happening. You hear about all these attacks every day. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just caused so much fear. And I don't know how we go forward in trying to tackle something like this. Sure. Thank you, Mina, for uh, calling and sharing your experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Elena, very difficult, obviously. Uh, you know, her experience that the uh, call has gone through and uh, I can't imagine what she's gone through and with her son there as well. Um, the feeling seems to be that, you know, of uh, it, it doesn't feel as though enough is being done. That's the feeling that I got from what mm. the caller was saying, that this has happened and I'm psychologically affected by it. Mm. My son is throwing up, you know, women in uh, her fr circle of friends, they're worried when they're going out now. and. But nothing seems to be happening uh, to, to reassure people that, you know, it won't happen to them. Mm, yeah, I mean, was, well, first of all, thank you to Mina for sharing her story. Um, doubly shocking that someone did that when her son was there and that he's witnessed that. That's not something that he will forget. And so um, I hope that she's getting, she and her son are getting the support uh, that they need in order to talk about what happened to them and um, start recovering and dealing with it in some way. Um, it feels to me like um, what the, uh, I guess, establishment um, are trying to do is, uh, I guess, calm things down by saying, yes, it's happening, but it's not actually, it's not that big an increase. Um, everything will be fine. Uh, let's keep everything quite calm. Um, but the word in the community is just, actually, we just don't feel safe. Um, we don't feel safe to go out um, in groups, we don't feel safe to, uh, you know, just walk down the street anymore. Or even drive a car with uh, your window. Yeah, open. exactly, because it is one of the scary things about it is that it has been so random. Um, and I guess there are no, there is nothing you can say to stop people feeling like that, really. What needs to happen is uh, we need to get better at catching the people that are doing it. There need to be far more controls around access to the substances that they're using to do it. So some of the acids that have been used, you can buy on Amazon for a tenner. Um, some of it is available on building sites. So um, a colleague of mine, her boyfriend works on a building site. Um, you can easily just go into a cupboard and access what they use on mm. building sites. Sure. There's no like sign in book. There's okay. no log of how much they've got. So this sure. is all very, very easily accessible. Yeah, accessible. Thank um, you. So stopping that I think is part of what needs to happen. Um, but then I come it's back also, to you. We've got yeah. a caller on the line. Is that okay? Thank you. Mm. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, caller. I'm sorry, I'm back. Uh, no, that's fine. Please, uh, <laughs> how would you like to share, you know, uh, uh, on your experiences of what's happening? Thank you. Uh, really, very, uh, really harrowing account, personal account given. It's really very powerful. I hope. Uh, that particular contribution is, is, is known widely, actually. Uh, appalling, appalling thing. I wanted to make two points. First, about uh, acid attacks in Britain. If you look at a novel by Graham Greene, um, I forget the name of the book just now, actually, tongue-tied. Acid attacks in the 1930s were very common. Britain has a long history of acid attacks, so this has nothing to do with Bangladesh. But Bangladesh has dealt with this crime very effectively. The problem is in countries like Pakistan, which actually is pretty endemic, and India, which doesn't get any media coverage, has a, has a completely poisonous situation as far as acid attacks are concerned. The second thing I want to say is that Northern Ireland is, is an exemplar of what happens when police finally are forced into taking action. There was a division between the Irish Catholics who were never served by the police, who were mistreated by the police for hundreds, hundreds of years, right? Finally, there was a peace plan, and the police name was changed, police behavior was improved, um, induction of Catholic minority. By the way, Irish Catholics are actually regarded as being an ethnic minority, ethnic group. People don't realize this. It's not just a religious thing. It's also ethnic and colonial history, which is connected with it. And they were finally given some rights. The result is the Irish Catholics now have 
not uh, uh, completely, but certainly more respect for the police. And police are much more aware of the crimes against us Irish Catholic sure. Jews. So, so what do you, what do you think lot. needs to happen in this country to have much more tougher uh, you know, action against those found uh, guilty of such crimes? What do you think should happen? Okay, I think we might have lost that caller. I'm sure uh, they'll call back. Um, Majid, you know, following on from what Elaine was saying, um, are you worried, for example, when you go out of the house now, you know, because of the sister, we, we heard the call from the sister. Has it come to that stage where, you know, in this day and age, you know, when with all the advancement that we're, f we're afraid to leave our home? Um, again, I think even though I wear a hijab and I'm going out daily, I don't have an extreme level of fear and anxiety because usually the area that I'm in is quite multicultural and it's home. But, but the sister the who was, out, you know, yeah. the sister who obviously uh, phoned in, you know, she she, she was she felt the same way. You know, she yeah. did, she felt safe in her own neighbourhood. Now, that's completely changed. But I just think that if we go out again, you will never know until it happens to you, and that level of fear and anxiety will stick with you. But I just think if we go out of our homes and we're constantly feeling fearful and worried, we won't be able to do anything. Mm. As Muslim women, we need to be empowered, we need to be out there, we need to be doing things that put us on the forefront. The longer we are more worried about our fear than we are worried about doing things and taking collective action in our community and nationally, the longer things won't happen. Mm. So, so as much as we are worried, we need to do things, we need to take action. Okay, and Sonia, you know, the sister who phoned in, who, who had that horrific uh, incident happen to her, you know, she was talking about actually carrying weapons. Has it come to that stage where now we need to, you know, uh, we need to, you know, for self-defense, for kind of protection, we need to take self-defense classes, we need to carry weapons. Yeah. You know, has it come to that stage where, I, you know, we, we so. can't, we're, we're fearful of our lives when we go out of our house? I believe so, yes. I mean, with, I mean, it's devastating what's happened to her. And as a result, it's come to that extreme where she feels like she needs to carry a weapon with her, you know, to protect herself. Um, and it's it's on, on a rise. I mean, personally, even I'm a British-born Muslim, um, and as a result, result of what's been happening around the community, even I have some sort of fear. Even though every day I wake up and I think, you know what, I'm going to be okay. When you're in the, on the street, you're so much more vigilant, vigilant than before, you know? But just to hit on hate crime, hate crime isn't just a British problem, it's a wild phenomenon. You know, and I read this article by a gentleman called Daniel Berg for CNN, and um, he wrote, actually he took an excerpt out of a broadcast um, called Secrets um, of Islamophobia, where it said, Americans don't know many Muslims or haven't personally had a conversation with the Muslims. When you look at the um, RPPI, which is a private religion um, institute, research institute, they said about 56% of Americans um, don't know much about Islam and 26% know nothing at all. Um, so these things go to show, and it's actually been since then, since the research has been 30 years and nothing's changed. Although recently in media, Islam is out there more than ever. You know, there's Muslim organizations campaigning, you know, but yet people are not recognizing, you know, Islam as a sense, um, but are w always picking up on the negatives, okay. you know, and, and on the sideline, you're getting these attacks. Sure. So I think change needs to come from home. I think awareness needs to come from home. It needs to come from our community, recognizing, having a dialogue one-to-one -one with the community, talking about these things, issues, and getting it out there, and not just keeping it inside, sure. you know, within Thank the you. home. Thank you. Elaine, it um, feels like a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, you know, there are people who are now saying, you know, we need to carry weapons with us. Mm. But then there's been a rise of people, you know, a stop and search. Mm. So then, and, and especially if you fit a particular description. So on the one hand, you know, and this is, uh, how do we move forward? Because if we don't feel protected, you know, uh, mm. and we don't feel safe, and we feel as though we need to take action, you know, into our own hands, what's the way forward? Yeah, so I would never carry a weapon and obviously never encourage anyone else to do so. Um, it's the statistics and, uh, are very clear that if you carry a, a weapon, you're far more likely to be a victim of crime than if you weren't carrying one. Um, I mean, my uh, parents gave but me a, a rape alarm when I was 13. The, sure, so it could also be that up. the caller was uh, possibly uh, an, an item that could be used as a weapon. Yeah. We're, not, we're not saying, you know, someone can go gun or but, an, but anything, if you, you know, if you use something or if you take something out with that intent, then it's, it makes it more likely to happen. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, 
Europe. So I um, used to travel an hour to and from school every single day from the age of uh, 12. So um, I had a rape alarm, so you can still get them. If you pull them, they make an incredibly loud noise sure. um, and will attract attention. Um, there's lots of research as well that says if you yell fire, if someone tries to attack you, people are far more likely um, to come and help. So rather than carrying weapons, it would be things mm. like that that mm. I would suggest people to do. But I also think we just need a far more visible um, police presence, particularly in Tower Hamlets and places like uh, Newham where, um, where some of these attacks have taken place and doing that kind of targeted patrol of where things have ha happened in the past, making sure there's a very visible presence so that people in that community feel that they are now being protected and that they are a lot safer. Um, because I very rarely see any officers in, sure. in my community and I think that drives some mm. of the feeling of unsafety. Mm. Uh, Majida, without getting too political, uh, obviously we're aware of the cuts that have taken place within the police force. Do you feel as though if there was more presence, like Eleni is saying, on the streets, people would feel much more reassured and safe? I think before we think about that, we need to consider the barriers between the police force and the local community. A lot of people have this inherent distrust in the police force because of the ideas of systematic and institutional racism. So before having more visible police force, which I do personally think will be helpful, we need to make sure that our community is more um, aware and almost like like more personally able to relate to the police mm -hmm. force. And when we have more interfaith dialogue and just generally more cohesion within the community and more um, but should, participation, but then that will be useful. Sure. But is that a one way dialogue or is it something that do, do you feel that the police need to also actively make yeah, more of an effort but also with communities? Muslims themselves you know yes of course there are loads of things happening and we are victims but we need to critically self-evaluate what are we doing as a community are we doing enough how can we do more mm. so I think mm. this goes for both ways mm. um, so uh, carrying on from what uh, Majida was saying is there I guess, you know, we're at a stage uh, where some people possibly, you know, Medjid has spoken about the Muslim community doing more. Yeah. But on the one hand, if the community feel as though they're not being supported, how do you then motivate, inspire that community to be more involved and more active in community development? Because if they feel as though they're the targets and their voices aren't being heard mm -hmm. and they're being marginalised, how, how do you kind of unfold that? I mean... It needs to come from us. It needs to come from within, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I feel marginalised. But if you, if everything you do is then scrutinised, okay, how do you then kind of unpick that? I think we need to work together. The government needs to work with the community. Community is a vice versa situation. Um, if we're marginalised to that extent, um, where we feel like our word is not, our voice is not heard, then yes, government needs to intervene and you know take more action. With all these attacks that are happening, yes, there are a lot of you know psychological, psychologically affecting a lot of you know men and women as a result of these attacks. Um, but we don't have any. You know, um, inter no one comes in to intervene and say, hey, uh, you know, go to the doctor, talk about your emotional feelings, go and see a mental health practitioner. Should you know? that not come from top down? Should the government oh, not be absolutely. driving this Abs to reassure absolutely, people? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you've got hate crimes, yes. Um, but as a result, look at all these other things that are happening around the community, which is limiting us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the government needs to take more action, you know, in supporting, you know, not just that aspect but all different you know sure. environmental psychological aspects as well sure. thank you uh, we've had an email here uh, from a uh, sender who wants to remain anonymous who says mm. uh, acid attack has been on the rise since the terror attacks media seems to have picked up the news now as non-muslims uh, were attacked mm. uh, we have to complain and challenge the media when they do not report news affecting certain communities early or correctly so and and you know uh, carrying on from that Elaine um, according to the independent group tell mama um, who recorded that after the um, Westminster attacks mm. over three uh, three days there were about 63 incidents that were reported um, what can we conclude from that I think the way that the media reports things a lot of the time is very unhelpful so some of the the uh, rhetoric that they use is not helpful. Um, so my recollection of the Westminster attack was 
immediately they start going into you know what mosque was the person visiting have they been radicalized all of and and all of that comes out um, and then living in tower hamlets uh, there then tends to be um uh, where i live everyone starts looking towards east london mosque and starts questioning everything that happens in there now i visited that mosque on a number of occasions um and have never been concerned about what goes on there but the media narrative is um, always that the individual must have been radicalised by other people in the community um, and ignore a lot of the growing evidence which is that actually a lot of this is people that feel they've been ostracised by society anyway and then are actually getting their information from the internet uh, rather than that they're being radicalised in um, in mosques sure. or any Thank other you. institutions. Thank you. So uh, Majid, as we come uh, to the end of the show, how would you, what would be your advice to people watching at home, you know, young people? What would you say, what do they need to do uh, and you know, how should they get involved to try and tackle this? I think obviously, like as we have heard from personal experience, this isn't exaggerated, it's real and it's happening. So firstly, be cautious, be vigilant, try and travel in groups and if anything like that, like this does happen, as much as you may have preconceived notions of police and about reporting, report these things mm. to the police, to groups like MEND or even tell Mama UK, whatever your political um, stance is. And on top of that, as Muslims, young Muslims, old Muslims, our mums, our grandparents, our aunties, we all need to be more aware and educated. Learn more about everything that's going on. Be more aware about government, who your local MP is, your local councillors. The more active we are in our community, the more that will get done. The longer it takes, the more we will suffer and it will be gradual, but we have to carry on and sure. kind of persevere in this atmosphere. Thank you. And lastly, to work in your community and interfaith dialogue mm. and just within your entire community sure. be aware and communicate thank you and sonia you know your advice to our mothers and uh, fathers community members who are watching this mm, exactly what majida said you know um, at the end of the day if we work together you know we'll be able to kind of if working together we'll be able to reduce selective reporting sure. um, and at the end of the day parents mom our moms and dads Yes, you know, they'll be worried, etc., etc. But try and, you know, eliminate those. At the end of the day, we, we are in, in, in a community and we are going to try and, I guess, to some extent, um, work together to have a conversation to make them understand sure. that, yes, it's, around, it's, yeah. it's happening, but, you know, let's be proactive rather Thank than you. staying indoors. Thank you. Elaine, and finally, uh, you know, uh, what would be your advice to people from the media and the police who are watching this? Uh, you know, what would be your advice to them? I think with the, the politicians, <laughs> I think with the police is that they need to listen to the community and understand that people still feel unsafe and they can't just stand there and say, don't worry, it's fine. They need to do a lot more work to build links with the community and understand why people feel so concerned, because I think part of it is this is kind of a crystallization of things that have been going on for definitely the past year and longer. Um, so it's not just a new thing in the community. This is a, it's yet another attack against that community. So they need to do more to understand that. Um, I think for the media, um, they need to calm down and think about how they represent Muslims and Islam uh, as a whole to people. And rather than doing this very selective um, piecemeal discussion about it that they like to do, making sure that they give a full picture of the community. Okay. Um, I've been lucky enough to take part in all kinds of events and this is what I would say to politicians and just anyone from I guess my community which obviously is not Muslim or Bengali is that it's an incredibly open community I'm lucky enough to come and do things like this I was at the Council of Mosques Eid dinner last week and I was at uh, the Bangladesh independence celebrations at the end of last year and uh, like this is not a community that is closed off and doesn't want to engage with anyone sure. else and you. Um, you can go and uh, make all kinds of links with people okay thanks a lot Elaine. now uh, we've run out of time so we're gonna have to conclude thank you to uh, my guests who have come on the show today thank you to uh, people who have phoned in and people who have emailed as well I think clearly you know this is just the start of the conversation uh, the advice seems to be overwhelmingly that we need to be vigilant but at the same time we need to have those discussions have those dialogues uh, and you know involve people in the solution otherwise you know, if we don't involve the authorities, the police, even with the media as well, engage 
so that we can come up with a solution which will help all of us. But at the same time, you know, please be vigilant when you go out and please advise others as well to be vigilant so that, you know, they are not affected by this. But please, uh, safe uh, and inshallah see you soon. Assalamu alaikum.